Capitalism fucks us all. It has created an airbrushed, sterile, industrial sexuality based on repetition, robotics and mechanics, preoccupied with performance and perfection, limiting sex to fuck and chuck quickies, masking our sexual insecurities through mass consumerism, whilst we are bombarded with images of hairless, plasticized vulvas endlessly pummeled by an assembly line of disembodied cocks. By capitalism, I'm referring to an economic system where the maximization of private profit lies at its core. Central characteristics of capitalism include the endless pursuit of profit, which requires endless growth, the exploitation of workers, and the drive to commodify everything imaginable. Much of what I will discuss in this video can't purely be reduced down to capitalism. Capitalism, white supremacy and patriarchy are all intersecting systems of oppression. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to talk about capitalism in this video. And in my next video, I'll discuss patriarchy's impact on our sex lives. The precarity of life under capitalism, from the cost of living crisis to overwork, soul-crushing commutes, and trying to squeeze time for cooking, cleaning, and childcare into the remaining hours, not to mention the constant threat of climate catastrophe, war, and pandemics, means that most of us live in a zombified state, exhausted to our core. Under these conditions, it's hard to find the time, energy and bandwidth for passion, sex and intimacy. In fact, research has found that young people in the UK and US are having less sex than previous generations and the average duration of sex lasts just seven to eight minutes, including foreplay. Even when we do make time for sex, it's hard to be fully engaged or present with our partners because the stresses of life are constantly weighing us down. And let's face it, there's no bigger cock block than arguments about money or discussions about taxes. On top of that, with extortionate housing costs, many of us have to live with our parents or flatmates well into our 30s, meaning that we're very limited in terms of when, where and how we can have sex. It's not exactly fun when you're constantly having to worry your dad's going to walk in on you or hear you coming. And even more insidious, the hypercapitalist normalization of productivity, efficiency, workaholism teaches us to feel a strong aversion to rest, leisure and play. A study in 2013 found that people in the US were so used to working that just imagining rest created intense stress. So even if we could have sex, we often choose not to because pleasure has almost become painful. I, for example, have often found that it's just at the moment where I'm about to come that I feel the need to change things up in some way. I just can't handle the pleasure. I don't feel deserving of it. Having mediocre sex or no sex at all is often a lot more comfortable to handle. So what I've been trying to say is that the grind of capitalism is not only stripping us off of the external circumstances necessary for sex, it's also leading us to internalise a disavowal of sex because we've been so strongly encultured to deprioritize and even reject pleasure. Capitalism increasingly leads us to treat each other as commodities rather than real flesh and blood human beings. We think of our sex partners transactionally in terms of use and exchange value. We take and deplete as much as possible and when they're no longer of use to us, we get rid of them, throw them away, get another. 
We are taught to accumulate more and more commodities, our status is enhanced by racking up transactions. So how good we perceive our sex lives to be is simply reduced to accumulating cock and cunt. We treat our sex partners like commodities, trying to find the best item on the market, someone that can enhance our status. We're not used to getting anything for free, so the harder the item is to get, usually by disregarding their boundaries and consent, the better quality they must be. But just as with the things we buy, we are never satisfied with what we have, always thinking there is more or better elsewhere. We are constantly aware of our disposability and replaceability, so in order to outcompete our competitors, we feel pressure to perform certain sex acts to ensure our success on the sexual marketplace. So essentially, capitalism has led us to apply financialized thinking to our sex lives, fundamentally warping how we relate to each other, stripping us of the capacity for mutuality, collaboration and equality during sex. Very much related to the previous point about financialization, capitalism's insatiable drive for increasing profits and creating new market opportunities has led to the commodification of sex. Capitalism constantly sells us the idea that there is an idealized, optimized sexual self that we should aspire towards. And the way to achieve this ideal is through endless consumption. Corporations capitalize on our sexual insecurities and anxieties, that we are boring in bed, not attractive enough, that we are missing out, and sell us the solutions through sex toys, sex shops, sexual lingerie, self-help books, magazines, kink tools, sex apps, gyms, penis pumps, and cosmetic surgery. Whilst there's not anything inherently wrong with these products, capitalism needs us to purchase more and more in order for these industries to continue to thrive. So they constantly manufacture new insecurities, anxieties and dissatisfactions into us to keep us in an endless cycle of consumption. The 1.5 trillion retail sales industry depends on sexual estrangement between men and women and is fueled by sexual dissatisfaction. Ads do not sell sex. That would be counterproductive if it meant that heterosexual women and men turned to one another and were gratified. What they sell is sexual discontent. In this context, there's never an end point where our idealized sexual selves have been reached. We are never quite up to scratch. Our ultimate sexual selves and our ultimate sexual experiences are always some point way off in the future. Sexuality is therefore permanently undermined, incomplete, open to change, and so a realm of uncertainty and an inexhaustible source of anxiety and soul-searching as well as fear that some precious kinds of sensation have been missed and the pleasure-giving potential of the body has not been squeezed to the last drop. When we have all these anxieties and insecurities about our sexual selves, how other people perceive our sex lives can become more important than anything we ourselves may desire. I, for example, used to parade around in uncomfortable lingerie, use kegel balls to tighten my vagina, buy more and more sex toys, not because I actually enjoyed these things, but because they were fashionable, they were what was expected, because this supposedly enhanced my desirability. Presenting an image of being sexually liberated became more important than actually being liberated liberated. The philosopher Gary Gutting summarized the pressures of sexual lifestyleism perfectly when he wrote, 
Isn't promiscuity as demanding an ideal as monogamy, the imperative to be sexually adventurous as burdensome as a prudish limitation to the missionary position, the magazines, self-help books and sex manuals that guide us to a life of liberated sexuality seem to induce in us as much insecurity and fear about our own sexual attractiveness and ability to perform as sermons and tracts did our grandparents over the dangers of self-indulgence. In my experience, authenticity, openness to learning, curiosity, vulnerability, deep presence are key to great sex. So if we are all coming from a place of lack and not feeling at ease with ourselves or our partners, and if we are preoccupied with perfection and aesthetics, it's unlikely that we will be able to be good lovers or be able to have a truly authentic, erotic and embodied sex life. Capitalism relies on the mechanization of the body, transforming the body into a machine, disconnecting us from the realm of deep feeling. This is because under capitalism, work, productivity, efficiency are valorized, whilst sensations, desires and emotions are not. If we are alienated from our bodies and feelings, we more willingly submit to our bodies being disciplined and controlled by our employees. When we are cut off from the sources of deep feeling in our lives, we consume and consume to fill the empty void within us. The more we lose sight of our sensations and desires, the more we are willing to accept the ugliness our culture creates. We become immune to the horror and despair we may otherwise have to confront. As the Cuban-Haitian revolutionary Paul Lafargue wrote, capitalist ethics, a pitiful parody on Christian ethics, strikes with its anathema the flesh of the labourer. Its ideal is to reduce the labourer to the smallest number of needs, to suppress his joys and his passions, and to condemn him to play the part of a machine, turning out work without respite and without thanks. The mechanization of the body can have a profound impact on our sex lives because the more estranged we are from our bodies and our feelings, the more mechanical, roboticized and depersonalized our sex lives become. I first came to realize how mechanical my sex life had become when a guy I was with told me that the way I masturbated purely relied on strength and velocity. I was treating my body like a machine focused on productivity and efficiency to drive towards the orgasm as a goal with little satisfaction or pleasure in the process. With this mechanization of sex, instead of a deeply embodied experience full of passion, emotion and intimacy, sex is reduced to technique, repetition and desensitization, the so-called cold fuck. When we are estranged from our bodies and feelings, it becomes difficult to discern when our bodies and boundaries have been violated, let alone understand and recognise the needs, desires and bodily cues of our partners. It becomes increasingly difficult to look in the mirror and see a clear reflection of our deepest instincts and desires. It's also hard to really connect, be present and vulnerable with others, making us increasingly bad lovers. And the constant emphasis on discipline and control means we're losing the capacity to simply play, let go and explore. I have little knowledge or experience of sacred sexuality, but I do believe there's also a whole underdiscovered realm of sex possible to us, sex as transcendent, mystical, cosmic experience, sex that shatters the illusion of mastery, independence and control, sex that can transport us into a feeling of profound union, wholeness and oneness with all beings. The capitalist mechanization of sex, on the other hand, boils sex down to little more than a few minutes of genital stimulation. (music) 
Porn precedes capitalism, but capitalism has brought it to an industrial scale where it now resides as a multi-billion dollar industry. No matter how ethical porn professes to be, the profit motive at the heart of any industry under capitalism pushes porn industries to make ever more controversial, extreme and provocative content with ever younger women, ever more degrading and assaultive acts in order to outcompete their competitors. This has resulted in popular porn categories that are heavily racialized, rampant paedophilic themes like teen or daddy daughter, women servicing men, violence against women, stark power imbalances, or forced and coerced sex. It's not my intention to shame or judge people for their desires or kinks, and by criticising the porn industry, I'm not in any way criticising the performers, but we can't pretend porn exists in a vacuum with no connection to wider issues. Porn is our main and sometimes only form of sex education. Porn programs our desires. We have to take a critical look at the impact porn may have. How does race play impact how we view racial minorities? To what extent does porn normalise infantilising women, the pursuit of children, and even amplifies paedophiles themselves? How does porn that degrades, dehumanises, and exercises violence over women feed into rape culture and male entitlement? Why does it turn us on to see someone physically harmed or dehumanised or objectified? To what extent does our increasing reliance on images impact our ability to maintain arousal, concentration and connection during sex? To what extent is authentic sexual individuality possible when we are all just mirroring the pornified sexual scripts we have been given? And in case it sounds like I'm being preachy, I want to make clear that these are things that I too am grappling with. I began my carnal adventures reproducing exactly what I saw in porn. I learnt to arch my back and fake moan before I learnt what my genuine desires and boundaries are. When I was 19 and experienced my first breakup and in my lonely horny state went on an extreme porn rampage, I immediately noticed that I would start to look at women in my day-to-day life differently, always wondering what they looked like naked and checking out their bodies before I engaged with them as human beings. And I had to painfully come to terms with the fact that my desires for BDSM were a form of re-traumatization, recreating my childhood sexual trauma. I now firmly believe that porn in its modern capitalist form is a type of ideology, indoctrination and propaganda that ties our pleasure centres to white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. In the words of John Stoltenberg, Pornography eroticises male supremacy. It makes domination and subordination feel like sex. It makes hierarchy feel like sex. It makes force and violence feel like sex. It makes hate and terrorism feel like sex. It makes inequality feel like sex. Pornography keeps sexism sexy. It keeps sexism necessary for some people to have sexual feelings. It makes reciprocity make you go limp. It makes mutuality leave you cold. It makes tenderness and intimacy and caring make you feel like you're going to disappear into a void. It makes justice the opposite of erotic. It makes injustice a sexual thrill. Ultimately, capitalism is increasingly seeping into our sex lives so that what should be some of the most beautiful and intimate moments with each other contains some of the deepest and most insidious forms of structural violence. At the same time, the more we perpetuate an alienated, industrialised vision of sexuality, the more likely we are to normalise and become desensitised to capitalism. It's a vicious cycle. 
So how can we bring about a complete and radical change in the way we relate to each other in sex? Ultimately, there can be no genuine sexual liberation without a liberation from our capitalist system via educating, agitating and organising. But could it also be possible that we have sex that transforms the world rather than mirrors its most destructive attributes? Sex that is a mechanism through which we can change and dismantle the oppressive systems of our time. Sex as a radical act. I want to end with some words from the brilliant black feminist writer Audrey Lorde, who famously wrote that sex can enable us to feel on a visceral level our profound capacity for joy, playfulness, adventure, tenderness, equality, mutuality and compassion. And that irreplaceable knowledge of our capacity to feel on such a deep visceral level comes to demand from all of life that it be lived with the knowledge that that satisfaction is possible. For once we begin to feel deeply all the aspects of our lives, we begin to demand from ourselves and from our life pursuits that they feel in accordance with that joy which we know ourselves to be capable of. Our erotic knowledge empowers us, becomes a lens through which we scrutinise all aspects of our existence, forcing us to evaluate those aspects honestly in terms of their relative meaning within our lives. And this is a grave responsibility, projected from within each of us, not to settle for the convenient, the shoddy, the conventionally expected, nor the merely safe. Thank you so much for watching. These videos take an enormous amount of time, energy and resources to create. So I'd really appreciate if you could consider becoming a patron and liking and sharing this video as far and wide as possible to help my little channel to grow. If you become a patron, we have a Discord server where we come together every two weeks for community discussions. Our next discussion will be about sex, so if you want to come join, please feel free to do so. I also have a monthly podcast for patrons where I discuss things that are maybe too personal to share on here. My last podcast was about my sexual experiences and reflections on those and how I've learned and grown from them and the politics of that. Sex toys became an unhealthy crutch I would use with partners to preempt sexual dissatisfaction, providing a solution that wasn't communicating or educating him because that was too taboo. Thank you so much to my current patrons for helping to make this channel possible. I really couldn't do it without you. Your support means a lot. Thank you so much.